Welcome everybody to our next webinar within the series of uh, Ask JFD Power Webinars. Yeah, um, you are at JFD Brokers and uh, please feel welcome at JFD. My name is Stefan Friedrichowski and you can just call me Stefan if you want. Today's topic is profitable pair trading strategy. Yeah, that is uh, our topic for today. And you will learn how to build up a pair trading strategy. And I will show you some more details, not only the strategy itself, but also how that kind of strategy can really be developed by simple Excel exercise. And uh, that will open up um, such a strategy which lives from highly correlated markets and we will see that it's not only possible to do it for the example of choice for today which is Brent versus WTI oil so the two kind of oil uh, which I will um, focus today but uh, there are other opportunities for pair trading as well Oh, by the way, I forgot uh, to mention the date for today is the 19th of April 2017. Um, some additional information uh, at the beginning because um, I'm new here for JFD with those kind of webinars. Therefore, I will introduce myself a little bit more. But uh, before really starting, um, please notice that uh, within your GoToWebinar control panel, uh, you will find already the slides uh, ready for download. So um, the slides of my talk here, uh, I have uploaded those slides. That means you can download them via the GoToWebinar control panel. Very good. And many thanks that you are here. Okay. One final remark, um, and I have to do it as always. Uh, that is uh, just a risk disclaimer. Uh, I have to show that slide uh, all the time, and it's um, necessary, but I think you understand why. Finally, we talk here about trading strategies, but nevertheless, whenever you trade, you trade by your own, on your own risk, um, and that is sure uh, and i think you understand that but we have to mention um, that risk disclaimer as always but now let me introduce myself a little bit um, more in detail and you see here already a small picture of mine and uh, yeah that picture is um, not that old it's only a couple of months ago so it's really me um and by the way, I am 50 years old, uh, so half a century is behind me, the next half is before me. Yeah, Stefan Furichowski is my name, really a very complicated last name. And um, I mentioned already there's a direct contact possibility, so you can have, uh, you can get in touch with me directly, and then you can use the email address. Uh, s.friedrichowski at jfdbrokers.com. So my last name is not quite easy, but uh, if you have the slides, then uh, you have automatically my full name. The way how I became a full-time trader, yeah, that's uh, maybe not um, directly straightforward because I have studied physics, worked in that uh, area for a couple of companies. Um, but um, yeah, the background with physics stands already for the kind of trading I follow always. And that kind of trading is not that much based on charts. Although charts are important because charts give me the ideas for the next uh, trading strategy. But finally, whatever I find in the chart, I investigate in detail from a more mathematical or from a more statistical point of view. And only if I can prove from a historical consideration that whatever I have in mind as being a good trading strategy, that has to be proved in the history. 
And even then, of course, I don't know whether the same kind of approach still is valid for the actual future. But at least to have that proof is what is by far very important for me in order to say, yes, now I have a good strategy and that is exactly the way I want to go. I do a lot of steps always uh, based on Excel, uh, as I will show you here within that uh, webinar. But finally, when I do trading strategies, especially when I go down the time frames um, to H4, H1, M5, uh, then uh, there's a need to have something which is much faster in order to investigate all those kind of ideas and uh, that is done by self-written C programs uh, because they are yeah, really by a factor of about 100,000 faster than Excel or even um, 1,000 times faster than any backtest in MT4. So mm, that's the reason why I do all those uh, in-depth investigations uh, with those C programs. And everything I do only in order to prove my approach. To avoid overfitting is a very important topic and I will do some extra webinars on that topic as well um, because it's really important. There are a couple of methods in order to avoid overfitting um, and I know all those kind of techniques and all those techniques are applied um, during the development of any trading strategy. So my background, once again, is not directly a technical an, uh, analyst. It's more from a mathematical point of view. Good. But now that was everything about introduction. Let's jump into the topic of today. And that topic of today is pair trading. And in order to um, open that kind of field for you a little bit more in detail, I want first to define uh, what is really a pair trade. What does it mean, pair trading? Or other names are ratio trades or spread trades or <clears throat> there are hundreds of names for that kind of approach. And in principle, one always um, is trading two symbols, two underlyings simultaneously. And always we trade one short and one long. So um, you, will, you will see the, uh, the details later. There are some certain requirements uh, for those kind of trading activities. And for example, one requirement is that we want to have market neutral trades. So in principle, if the overall market only changes, that should not have any uh, impact on those trades. What we really trade are market inefficiencies. And those are the ones we want to address by that kind of strategy of pair trading. Therefore, it's quite important to have a closer view on the lot size calculation in order to have a trade which is really market neutral. So that market neutrality is important for those kind of trades. And uh, therefore, I have a special topic on that as well. I will show some um, detailed results on uh, what I call always the master of pair trading. So the master example for me personally is Brent versus WTI oil. So the two kind of oils you can trade. Um, and the reason uh, is twofold. There's one reason is simply because those markets have a really good story behind when we talk about pair trading. And that kind of story is important. And you will see um, that, for example, if we go for other pairs like uh, S&P 500 and uh, Dow Jones, for example, then the story is not that good to have the same kind of approach for 
the pair S&P 500 versus um, Dow Jones. And what is the story behind Brent versus WTI? It's quite simple. Assume that um, one kind of oil, the price increases. Increases, increases, increases. And maybe the other one, the WTI, is constant or may even decrease. If that happens, then the overall market, and I'm not talking about market in terms of trading activities, the market itself. So then there will be a request uh, after WTI. And that request will increase. So the demand for the one which is constant in price will increase. And the demand for the one which already increases will decrease. Finally, what does it mean? The price for Brent would go down and the price for WTI would increase. So on a long run, those two symbols can't be really independent. It's not possible that one uh, oil constantly increases and the other one would decrease. And that is what I mean with a story. The story behind that pair Brent versus WTI is a strong story because those two kind of markets are really high correlated and not only in a mathematical sense, they are physically um, correlated. And that makes that kind of story that strong. Nevertheless, there are other possibilities to have um, to find other pairs you can trade, and I will mention those as well. By the way, whenever you have questions, just uh, don't hesitate and uh, use uh, the questionnaire functionality within the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, I will try to answer your questions online as good as I can. So the definition of a pair trade is quite simple. What we consider here is two markets, two symbols. And those two symbols are always traded simultaneously. We open the trades at a given time simultaneously, and we close both trades at a given time simultaneously. So whatever we do, we do always twice. Buying, so opening those trades and closing those trades is always at the same time. Additionally, we always open a long and the short position, but not on the same symbol, that does not make any sense, but um, on those two different symbols. Even if, for example, we think about S&P 500 and Dow Jones, we might open a long trade on S&P 500 and might open a short trade on Dow Jones. Or in this case, when we talk about Brent versus WTI, then we would maybe open a short trade on WTI and a long trade on Brent. What does it mean really to have those kind of two trades simultaneously? It's a little bit, um, and I would uh, just uh, say it in brackets here, it's a little bit the arbitrage trading for the small traders. So for us, for private traders, there are hundreds of other kind of arbitrage trading but totally different. In that case, you might uh, have a um, speed advantage from one um, uh, stock to the other one, uh, maybe between New York and Chicago, and uh, you know already a little bit of the price in the next milliseconds. That is a typical arbitrage trading. But in this case, we do something similar, but on a totally different time scale. So not on milliseconds, we do it on a daily basis. Our trades will have a typical duration of maybe um, three, four days. And nevertheless, the basics are the same. What we use here or what we really trade are short term inefficiencies in the market. Why do I call that 
inefficiencies. Remember that story about Brent WTI, one price might increase and the other one might decrease or being stable. That is a market inefficiency because on a long run, as I mentioned, those two prices can't be too far away. In this case, even nearly absolutely. Uh, like the price cannot differ that much because otherwise there's a, the normal market mechanism of, of uh, those who really buy physically those kind of oils, which would bring those two prices together once again. So we have a situation of short-term inefficiencies and those short-term inefficiencies we can trade and we can convert those inefficiency inefficiencies into profitable trades. I mentioned once again that those pair trades are always market neutral. So that market neutrality is very much important because if the overall market, for example, would increase, like think about we have a um, short and a long um, a short trade on Brent, long trade uh, on WTI, and the overall oil price would increase by 10%, that would not have any impact if our pair is really market neutral. Um, so the overall increase or decrease of the oil price has no impact on our trading results. What we try to find and what we use here is that market inefficiencies, which bring those prices together once again. And the basic requirement as always for those kind of trading activities is that the two markets are really highly correlated. But now that was a lot of, of theoretical considerations, but now let's really look to some uh, practical um, examples first um, by some charts and then later go into the details of how to open a trade and um, when to open a trade and when to close uh, that pair trade once again. What you see here in that chart is the Brent and the WTI price uh, since 2000. So it's about uh, 16 years price history for those uh, two prices. Uh, W2I in blue and Brent in red. And in this case, as you can see by the chart, the prices are more or less during the complete period identical. There's one period um, between 2011 and 2014. Um, there was a longer period with some deviations, but that overall deviation here um, of about 10 or 15 dollar, uh, that has not really an impact on our activities because we don't want to have trades open that long. So we don't want to have a trade which is open for three years. No, what we are looking later are uh, those small spikes, small deviations between blue and red. And that is the input or the, um, the starting point for any trade. We will zoom into that later and then you will directly see when and how to open such a pair trade. In general, the two prices follow each other quite close. So uh, there are no big differences uh, between those two. Let me introduce another example. Um, and now I have an example um, with totally different prices. <laughs> One is the S&P 500, so the index, um, the, the major index of the United States. And the other one is Dow Jones uh, in red. And um, right now we are about at the level of um, 20,000 for Dow Jones and uh, 2,200 or something for S&P 500. You see, in this case, of course, those two underlyings, they don't have the same price. Why? Uh, then there's no need that the two prices are more or less identical. What, what counts here, what's important is that the um, 
to the quotient of the two. So if you divide one by the other, that Z is more or less constant. And uh, I will have a Z on a slide on the next page. Nevertheless, what we can see here that the overall behavior for the last 16 years is absolutely quite similar, uh, similar between, between those two underlyings. You can see that all the spikes downwards or upwards are more or less at the same um, point in time. And uh, you have two kind of, of price behavior which are nearly identical. And of course, they should be more or less identical. But the story behind the more or less identical behavior between S&P 500 and Dow Jones is by far not that strong than compared to Brent and WTI. Think about the definition of Dow Jones and S&P 500. S&P 500, as the name tells you already, is um, an index based on 500 stocks of the United States. Dow Jones contains only 30 um, different companies. And in principle, it's possible, for example, that within the Dow Jones, there might be three um, um, stocks which increase extremely uh, well and they have a steep and uh, increase in price and that may be for not only months for even years so the dow jones is much more related to single stocks and there might be exceptions of those single stocks and their price behavior and therefore it's in principle possible that the Dow Jones might increase for a longer time and S&P 500 might decrease for a longer time simply because the overall market is um, going south. But the Dow Jones can, let's say, survive because of a few stocks of those 30 stocks which build that index. So therefore, the story here is not that good as compared to Brent and um, WTI. Because an increase of the one not means automatically that the other one has to increase as well. Um, in most cases, the behavior is similar. And if you do the next step here, you will see it much more in detail. What I have done now is I have created the quotient of the two prices. And in this case, um, it's uh, S&P 500 divided by Dow Jones. So you take a price of a specific date and um, then you divide one by the other. Overall, uh, that ratio is about between 0.11 and 0.12, um, more or less constant, but there are, um, let's call it trend, uh, a little bit like a trend behavior, even in that ratio. For example, here we have uh, four years um, uh, with an increase of that ratio, what does it mean? It would mean that the S&P 500 uh, is, for example, stronger than the Dow Jones because if the S&P 500 increases a little bit more than the Dow Jones, then the ratio of the two would increase as well. So here we have such a behavior which is not that good for pair trading that we have long-term trends within that ratio. And if you look for, at the beginning of my, my history here, uh, the first two, three years, we have a steep decrease for that ratio as well. In between, there are faces which really wiggle around, which is good that wiggling around is exactly what we really need for our um, pair trading activities. But you will see it when I zoom into those um, 
prices and ratio charts uh, later. I have done the similar or the same for Brent versus WTI. And now you can immediately see that there's a, a difference between the two behavior. Let me switch around a little bit because then it becomes much more obvious. So you see for Brent ratio uh, versus WTI, that it's much more short-term related. It, it looks a little bit like noise, uh, I know, but exactly that kind of noise uh, is later what we will trade. So, but we have those ups and downs in that ratio. And that means that on a short-term behavior, one price or one oil is let's call it a little bit too expensive compared to the other one and whenever we have that kind of situation that one is a little bit too expensive compared to the other one that is a trigger for a trade but there's later um, a quite uh, more mathematical definition of what is a little bit too expensive compared to the other but that kind of ratio looking here, um, what we can find in that chart is exactly what we need for profitable pair trading strategy. Before I jump into the Excel sheet and uh, go to the details of when and how to open a trade, uh, let me in general describe that kind of approach, which is later uh, implemented in that Excel sheet. What we need for to have more common rules for pair trading uh, strategies, we need a definition of what does it mean a little bit too expensive compared to the other one. And a very good trick here is that you apply an EMA to that ratio. Sounds strange. To that behavior, to that chart, we apply an EMA and you can already think about that kind of EMA uh, by eye. So an EMA is always smoothing that price behavior. So it would be in the middle of all those blue lines here. That would be the EMA on that ratio. It would filter, it will filter out a little of uh, the noise. And we call simply that EMA value, the fair value of the ratio. So that when I say fair ratio, that would mean, hey, that is a price or the price ratio of the two underlyings, which is more common, more usual, more normal. And that will be done by that EMA. And now we look for deviations of that actual ratio compared to that EMA on that ratio. And whenever we find um, that it deviates quite impressive, then we say now we have a special situation. And I call it a special situation because one price is now compared to the other, too expensive. Or the other one is too cheap. Uh, it only depends on the direction of uh, your point of view. But in principle, one is too expensive and one is too cheap compared to the other one. And whenever we find that situation and the trigger will be that the actual ratio compared to the EMA on that ratio, if that deviation is high, uh, and it does not depend on um, below or above. It means that there's one symbol being too expensive and the other one being too cheap compared to the other one. And the trade now will be opened by the logic of what is too expensive will be traded short and what is too cheap will be traded long. So we assume that the prices will con convert once again 
and come together once again to that fair value of the typical ratio. And therefore, we trade one simple short and the other one long into the direction of the fair value of that ratio. So we assume that there will be a return and that is the one which is traded. And when that ratio will return to that fair value, automatically our trade is profitable and that's very good. As a trigger to exit a trade, to close our trades, our two trades, is simply whenever we have a cross between the EMA and the ratio itself. So that is the exit signal for such a trade. And that is in principle quite similar to what is called mean reversion strategies. But in this case, we trade that approach on two symbols simultaneously. The overall market and market movements, um, they do not count because we have that long and short trade. That is directly brings me up to the next topic, uh, the market neutrality here. And uh, that's the last slide I need in our, before I come to that Excel sheet and to have really the details of when to open a trade and when to close a trade. But before doing that, um, I want to um, focus you on that market neutrality. Think about, and maybe it's quite obvious, but it's important for those kind of trading activities. Think about you trade one lot short of uh, S&P 500 and you trade one lot long um, of Dow Jones. If you would do so, then this is definitely not market neutral. Because, hey, uh, S&P 500 is at uh, 2,200 and the other one is at uh, 20,000. So if we have a move of 5%, um, then definitely those two trades are not market neutral. And the calculation is um, quite obvious. You need exactly that kind of equation that the lot size of price um, of um, and symbol A times the price of symbol A uh, should be equal to the lot size of symbol B times the price of symbol B. If you apply that rule, then of course you have that market neutrality. Or let's come back to S&P 500 and Dow Jones. If you would for example, uh, about uh, open a trade with seven lots um, S&P 500 and one lot Dow Jones, one short, one long, that kind of trade would be market neutral in a sense that if both underlyings would increase by, for example, 5%, then the trading result would not be affected because uh, that doesn't count. Let me make the remark here that um, that kind of consideration is only valid uh, if the both underlyings um, have the same currency. For example, if you think you want to have a pair trade between FDAX and uh, S&P 500, then um, the exchange rate Euro US dollar has to be involved as well because S&P 500 is priced in um, uh, US dollar and uh, the FDAX in Euro. Okay. Uh, oh, <laughs> uh, sorry. I just uh, looked to the questions and uh, I see my mistake on the slides <laughs> um, because uh, originally those slides have been in German and I have not translated every word here. So you find the word here, which is called course, um, and course means uh, price. <laughs> Sorry for that mistake, I will correct it. Uh, so now we have it. Um, that's funny and uh, I see already that you laugh um, uh, as well. So that's the reason. So lot size of symbol A times 
price of symbol A um, should be equal to lot size symbol B times price symbol B. Okay, now we have it. <laughs> uh, that's uh, quite uh, funny. Good. One final remark here for that kind of strategy, um, because we have two trades, and those two trades act simultaneously. We don't have a real stop loss. At least we don't have a stop loss in a sense uh, like if that trade is 100 euro in the minus or hitting uh, a certain value, then um, the stop loss should be activated. For that kind of trading activity, you need another concept uh, for stop loss setting. It's not a stop loss for the trade on a single symbol. You need a stop loss on that pair trade. So if the two prices would differ even more, then your combined trade uh, would go into the minus. And what we need is a stop loss on that combined trade. Good. But now, as promised, I will show you some more details and then I think everything will be a little bit more obvious how that strategy really works and how you can derive by your own that kind of strategies. Um, I mentioned it already, but uh, if you send me an email to um, s.friedrichowski at jfdbrokers.com, um, I will send you that Excel sheet as well. So um, it's not a secret. You can have it. Um, just send me an email and uh, I will uh, respond as soon as possible. So let me guide you not really to the details of that Excel sheet. Let me more guide you to the principle of um, when to open a trade and why we open a trade at a certain point in time. Nevertheless, a few comments on the Excel sheet um, in details. So we have here the prices of a WTI. Um, that's always um, open, high, low, close. And the same for Brent. Um, and that's for the last uh, 16 years. What we built here or what we calculate is, uh, as I mentioned on my slide, simply the quotient of the two. So the, rate, the ratio of WTI uh, divided by Brent, that's all. So then we have that ratio, which in this case for WTI compared to, um, to Brent, is always around one. The next step is now that we calculate an EMA on that ratio. That EMA is a um, simple formula. Uh, you can find it in the web or within my Excel sheet here that we can change the EMA period and that we can change automatically the EMA values simply by uh, typing a different EMA period um, in that uh, yellow um, box. So then we create the EMA on that ratio. Finally, what we do here is we build the difference between the actual ratio and the EMA on that ratio. And that will give us later the entry signals. But let me show you a little bit more simply by looking to charts. The first chart is the same you have seen already. And that chart um, is the ratio itself. And now new in red, the EMA on that ratio. And as I mentioned, if you use short periods for the EMA period, then um, the red line follows um, quite obvious the blue line of the actual ratio. But here we can't see everything in detail. So let's zoom. So that's um, a specific period. Uh, now, same graph, but only zoom into uh, only 200 days and not the complete period of uh, 16 years. And now you can see what I mean hey, there are sometimes huge deviations from that EMA. You see that spike here? 
you see sometimes a spike to the south, sometimes a spike to the north. And those are the ones we want to trade. This becomes even more obvious if we now build the difference between, between the two lines, between the actual ratio and the um, EMA on that ratio. And first, here is a chart for the complete 16 years. And now it really looks like noise. Uh, and the uh, funny thing is that in the middle, you can see the financial crisis 2008. Um, and the funny thing is exactly that kind of noise is what we will trade. You will see it here if I zoom once again into that. So what is in the chart? In the chart is the difference between the actual ratio and that EMA on that ratio. And now it becomes obvious what we want to trade. Think about two horizontal lines, one a little bit in the plus, one a little bit in the minus here. And whenever that difference between actual ratio and EMA on that ratio will be above that line, that is a trigger for a trade. And then always the long and the short trade, um, um, the too expensive one will be traded short, the mm, too cheap one will be traded long. And afterwards, we wait until that difference between actual ratio and EMA crosses the zero line once again, and that creates the end of our trade. That's all. So opening a trade, when we see that deviations, closing, close the trade when we come to normal. And that come to normal means here that the difference between actual ratio and EMA on that ratio crosses the zero line. And you see, of course, it depends how many entries we will have. It depends on the actual value of our two horizontal lines, one above zero, one below zero. But you see now the concept. What we trade is exaggerations. Whenever we have huge deviations, that is a trigger for a trade. And this is not only theory in uh, looking here to those kind of charts. Um, what I now, let me zoom here a little bit out. Uh, so then you can see what else uh, is within that Excel sheet. Finally, I look for all the trades which are opened according to those rules. So the opening rule is whenever we have that huge deviation. The closing rule is whenever we come back to normal behavior, then we close the trades. Since it's a pair trade, we always open a trade on WTI and we open a trade on Brent. And now within that chart here, you can see in total three equity lines. Up to now, it's not really an equity uh, in terms of euros or US dollar. It's um, percentage increase of uh, our trade or percentage result of our trade. But anyhow, it's uh, something quite similar to uh, an equity. And you see that um, yeah, the, the overall 16 years equity of all trades on uh, WTI in blue and all trades uh, of Brent in red. What really counts here is the sum of both, because as I mentioned, we trade everything simultaneously. And that is the yellow line. And you see a very good increase in that um, yellow line. And that means that kind of approach is profitable and even more. What is important that, for example, if we change now our parameters like EMA values, for example, then it not automatically ruins our strategy. So I can 
use different values and um, if you might say hey uh, going from four to five is not that huge no it's huge it's an increase of 25 percent so it um, would be the same if you have an EMA of 200 and 250 so that's already a big difference between those kind of EMAs and the other number here describes those two horizontal lines the one above zero and above uh, below zero and if I change those numbers numbers uh, that means that I change a little bit my my entry signal or my entry level of um, when I measure the deviation between the actual ratio and the EMA on that ratio and you can see hey it does not have that huge impact of my equity and that's good that's a good part of the story that it does not change those results that creates what i always call robust strategies because they don't depend on the actual uh, details on the actual numbers of my parameters for entry and exit in this case for ema period and um, the horizontal lines for uh, for entry so therefore i know already that that kind of strategy is doing well because it's robust finally the story here within the excel sheet goes a little bit further for example um, spreads are considered so um, because if i would set those spreads to zero that would even um, uh, increase my my trading results but we know that we have to pay spreads and therefore those are incorporated into that excel sheet um, just for a second i will do it uh, that i uh, go for zero then you can see that we get even much better results but that is misleading strategies calculated without any spreads is nonsense therefore we have to apply whatever the market um, um, or what the market gives us and in this case we know that we have spreads finally all the trades are recalculated in dollar and then we get equity lines um, in um, us dollar and uh, to just to mention uh, short more details in this case everything is already adjusted to jft brokers that means um, the minimum lot size uh, for trades on Brent and W3I is 0.1 and uh, the step size is 0.1 as well. So we cannot trade what is originally calculated in the, here, like uh, 2.0072 lots for the WTI trade and 2.1533. No, uh, we have to live with the limitations and the limitations in this case are 0 0.1 0 0.1 lot and that is uh, good enough here um, so we are not exactly market neutral um, but we come close to that market neutrality and what is typical here uh, is those results which you can see here already in the excel sheet like whenever we close a trade then there might be one trade ending with a plus 40 and the other one with a minus 16. That is quite typical. That I go a little bit down here, that for example, in this case, we have one trade, uh, that's the WTI trade, which finally ends with a minus of uh, 51 euro and the other one with plus 290 that's really typical because that's the overall market movement um, what counts is the sum the sum of those two trades and that you don't think that everything is uh, positive uh, whenever you do here uh, here for example is a result um, yeah there's a trade ending uh, finally even with a sum with a minus but you will find <laughs> other examples as well within the excel sheet so not uh, it's not a money printing machine um, but uh, in most cases we have more profits than um, minus results on the opposite trade so 
what I would like to mention as well here, um, I mentioned that in principle, there is no stop loss. And that means in this case, for example, there has been a time, and that was during the financial crisis 2008, that floating wise, a trade would have been at minus 1000 euro. The end result of that specific trade is not minus 1000. In this case, even that trade was profitable. But looking to the logic of that kind of uh, trading activity, it's possible. And therefore, I mention it once again, because it's not that usual that I have um, strategies without a hard stop loss uh, as normal. So that is the result of Brent versus WTI. And just uh, that you know, um, that kind of strategy is already in a test phase here um, to be implemented uh, directly based on expert advisors uh, that you see an example here. We have, um, there are two trades open now within that strategy and you can see it uh, on my screen, uh, hopefully in a second. Uh, I will wait uh, and then um, it should be visible for you as well. So we have um, two charts open, one for Brent, one for WTI uh, at uh, JFD Brokers. And since that is a test phase for the um, EA, which uh, finally will do the job automatically, um, it's uh, a demo account. And um, you see what's opened here. Two days, uh, no, one day ago um, in the middle of the night, um, there was uh, a trade opened, uh, a long trade on Brent and a short trade on WTI. What we can see, the overall market went dramatically south. That is not that important here. Uh, you can see that right now the mm, result is um, in sum a little bit in the minus. But we are not at the end. Let's see when we close a trade, whether the trade will be in sum profitable. Up to now, it's not. That's OK. Um, but uh, the trade is not ended. So what we wait is that back to normal. And when we reach that back to normal, meaning the uh, difference between the actual ratio and the EMA on that ratio crosses the zero line once again, then we close both trades. So that's the logic behind. And you can see um, it's nearly uh, ready to be traded uh, automatically. The logic is exactly what we found here in the Excel sheet. Um, but <clears throat> um, I want to do trading activities done by an expert advisor uh, finally and therefore that test phase in a demo account. I promised um, you that uh, that is not the only example and uh, just uh, to give you um, an example here what is in principle always necessary. So what we need for our selection of underlyings, we need highly correlated markets. So that's the base requirement for that kind of strategy. And even better, if you find a good story behind those two markets and why they should correlate that good. So I know from experience that, for example, uh, pair trades on um, S&P 500 versus Dow Jones or even gold and silver does not work that well because the story, that's my opinion, is not good enough. Even, for example, for gold and silver, the story is not really perfect. In principle, the two prices have a correlation. But think about the use of gold and the use of silver. Gold has different aspects. Gold is an investment, it's a safe harbor for, for money, um, a protection against inflation, and so on and so on. But um, you can, other, um, can do other things with gold as well. 
you can buy a wing, uh, for example, and um, give it to somebody else, whatever. So that is another use of gold as well. And finally, even in electronics, there's some amount of gold used in electronics. Silver, different story. It's, silver is not really used as an investment. Um, silver is more or less um, a product uh, for, for normal use. So therefore, the markets do not behave absolutely the same. What works, for example, are correlated to stocks. Um, and here's an example of uh, German companies like Bayer and uh, BASF. Um, and I show you this uh, just directly in an Excel sheet. Oh, what, just a second. Excel sheet is not opened up to now. Uh, takes only a second, then we will have it here. So same story, same behavior, same kind of Excel sheet, uh, meaning we have prices for uh, BASF and the other company Bayer. We have this spread chart here, that ratio chart, um, and we, you can see um, the behavior. And finally, now you know and how to interpret those kind of plots. What we have to focus our uh, is we have to focus on the yellow line. And that yellow line has a slow but steady increase so the slope as well um, strategy would work here as well so you can play around with um, other highly correlated markets and you will find lots of examples and even if i mention here two which do not work that well the reason is because i know a lot of other traders who, who believe that S&P 500 and Dow Jones works, or they believe that gold and silver works. But at least with that kind of entry logic, I um, showed here during that webinar, no, it does not work, at least not good enough. Um, the results are yeah, not that good. You can get it profitable, but uh, not same like Brent versus WTI. So in principle, it's a very good strategy. And that is already my summary for today's webinar. So pair trades work well, work really well, um, being a market neutral trade. And that is maybe an additional setup for your own trading activities as well. It's simple to derive that strategy. It's even possible to have considerations and um, calculations within Excel. And what is needed always for those kind of trading activities, you need highly correlated markets. But before already closing the webinar, keep in mind, if you have interest uh, into that Excel sheet, just send me an email and you see the address here once again s.friedrichowski at jfdbrokers.com. So get in touch with me and I will send you that Excel sheet. And keep in mind, there are lots of other webinars uh, with uh, JFD Brokers and you can find those on the web page of uh, JFD Brokers and you can register for any of the next webinars. Um, there are colleagues of mine and uh, and even I will do some additional webinars over the next weeks and months. So I hope you can enjoy those kind of webinars um, and see you again, maybe already next week with a uh, webinar uh, from me. But uh, of course, you should enjoy all the other webinars on at JFD Brokers as well. So have a good time. Have a good evening. And um, see you again next week. Thanks. Bye-bye.